I've worked on oil rigs for most of my adult life as a saturation diver. For the most part, I always loved the solitude of the job. Sometimes having to work at nearly a thousand feet underwater. I've spent most of my time as an adult completely isolated from the outside world. No matter what happens when you're at that depth, you can't just shoot to the surface and escape it. Not even death. You just have to stare it down and decompress slowly. So freaking slowly. If you spend only an hour at 250 feet below the surface, your decompression time, or your ascent, would have to be five hours to prevent getting even slightly bent. And that's what we call decompression sickness when the gases from the compressed air you've been breathing begin to expand, and, depending on what depth you've been at, kills you after causing dehabilitating and horrific pain. No career sat diver wants to risk it, and we always ascend, decompress, very slowly. And that's why I'm here to tell you my story. Had I done what my every instinct wanted me to do, I would have died. Eight years, I devoted to my job before I changed my mind about how much I loved it. Had I heard a story like this from one of my fellow employees, I would have laughed it off and went happily on my way. However, this was no second-hand tale, not something told when we were sitting around eating dinner and drinking the contraband beer. No. This happened to me, and I'm going to tell you about it even though there will be those among you who scoff, laugh, and even think I'm making shit up just to try to get your attention. So listen, you know who I laugh at now? Only the people who say there are no mysteries left, no unexplored places left on our earth. No things left that haven't been explained away by science. Those are the people I laugh at now. I used to laugh at a lot of things told by others. Used to. Not anymore. There are things left on this earth that you don't want to meet. And I had the distinct displeasure of meeting more than one of them when I worked for the Jupiter oil rig. It was big. No, it was a huge undertaking. When my bosses decided they were going to move the Jupiter operation, rig and all, to a different part of the ocean. It meant that the shift crews were going to have to work a lot of overtime stay on the rig for indefinite intervals, and lose a lot of sleep. We were all being well compensated, so at the beginning, none of us complained. Well, too much. And that always changes on an oil rig, though. You can't stick a bunch of roughnecks out in the middle of the ocean indefinitely and expect everything to go all peachy for very long. Tempers flare. Machismo rules the day eventually. Still, I could think of no better job to have. Or at least, I couldn't back then. By the time the rig was set up in her new placement, there had been a couple of brutal fights among the crew. They had been sent home immediately and replaced with other land-bound crew members. Harvey, my new boss, the boss of the Jupiter, held up like a hero out there. He practically lived on the Jupiter, and he loved his rowdy crew even though they sometimes caused him grief with his bosses. And it was eventually time for my job to begin. I had worked topside on the rig while it was being moved, and now that it was time to descend back into what John and I called the metal tube to get ready to start with the whole setup under the sea. We would be there for months this time, trying to get everything up and running safely and securely. There were only two of us who lived 
in the pressurized system under the flatbed boat, ready at any time to go out to do the work under the rig. You know, connecting pipelines, ensuring sturdy construction, and keeping the valves flipping to the moneymaker's setting. Jed Clampett had it right when he called oil black gold. Living in the pressurized system under the boat at a shallower depth than what we'd been working caused our bodies to become saturated with the gases that would allow us to stay underwater indefinitely, therefore becoming great assets to the company that owned the Jupiter. We were valuable assets and we knew it. John didn't enjoy the isolation and the job as much as I did. He liked the pay. If a janitorial job beachside would have offered him the same pay, John would not have hesitated to take it. Me, on the other hand, I would go batshit in a week of having to deal with people and the noise and the chaos of the topside world. There are several people working on the flatbed boat above us. They were responsible for our lives, more or less. They ensured we had our food, our compressed air, and we were as comfortable as possible while we were there. They mess up, and we die. There was a medical crew, of course, but no one wanted to have to call them in. And that would mean the situation was quite possibly irreversible. And that part of my job used to bother me, but I got used to it pretty quickly. The first couple of weeks after John and I had begun working our seven-hour shifts on the seabed had gone perfectly normal. Boringly perfect, actually. And usually, there were a few exciting encounters with the deep sea life, but the seabed seemed a bit empty. Had I not been so wrapped up in the sad luck stories John was intent on telling me about his recent girlfriend... I might have thought about exactly how odd it was for the seabed to be so devoid of creatures. But my head was still wrapping around the fact that John had told her it was okay for her to have another boyfriend while he was working. <laughs> no, I couldn't do that. Maybe that's why I never tried to have a relationship after I took on the saturation diver job. During the third week under... John and I hooked up some preliminary pipelines for a test and called it a day. Back in the metal tube, John and I waited for our dinner. He looked up at me while trying to call her on his cell phone, and his expression changed. He laid the cell on the table and smiled, folding his hands on the table and leaning forward. Did you hear that? John's smile wasn't one of joviality, I noticed. It was plastered in place, and he looked nervous. He sounded like Donald Duck. We both did. Well, we always did, but for some reason it struck me as funny this time, and I grinned. <laughs> Afraid not, buddy. Good. Our dinner came down via the pressurized tube system and we ate in silence. I noted that John would come across all pale and nervous as his eyes darted back and forth, never really settling anywhere. Before I settled in for a game of solitaire, I asked John if he was alright and he answered by asking if I'd seen anything strange out there while we were working earlier. No, it was the bottom of the ocean though. You know, everything looks weird at these depths. There were creatures that lit up, fished for food by dangling a little built-in light in front of their mouths. Yeah, there were weird things out here, but nothing that fell into the out-of-the-ordinary kind of strange. The next day, John was worse, and after our shift, his vitals were not in the green anymore. Fearing that he was coming down sick, the medical crew deemed it necessary to ready him for expulsion from the job. He would have to decompress in a solitary chamber just to make sure he didn't pass any germs to me. A simple cold can cause a fatality in my line of work. Blocked sinuses can cause trap pressure that we can't equalize and do permanent damage, or even death in some cases. 
I would likely be finishing the job alone. I would at least be down there for a month alone, until they could get someone else called in and safely pressurized to live in the tube for the duration of the job. The next day was, well, it was labor intensive. I tried to adjust my work to include some of John's responsibilities. I went over the pipeline we'd hooked up the day before just to make sure nothing was missed. John had obviously been sick or something, because there was missing bands. The entire thing would have to come down and be set up again, properly. The medical team wouldn't allow me to question John that evening. They said he was far too unstable for disturbances of any kind, and they wouldn't give me specifics about his diagnosis. That worried me. It worried me for my own well-being. Had he been contagious? Had he passed on some germ to me? I didn't feel sick, but the medical crew definitely kept a closer eye on me after John went into the isolation chamber to be decompressed. The next day, I went out to start my duties, and the first thing I noticed as I descended to the seafloor was a complete absence of movement other than mine. The lights on the worksite shone dimly through the blackness as I got closer, and it looked like an alien settlement to me. Rarely had I felt strangely going into a worksite I'd set up, but this day, I did. The water seemed darker, not murkier, just blacker, and I asked for a remote check of all the lighting as I descended and momentarily, one of the flatbed crew answered that all the lights were working properly, according to their monitors up there. He asked if everything was kosher, and I answered in the affirmative, even though it didn't feel kosher. I worked four hours without stopping to rest at all, and was feeling a bit fatigued when I finally did stop for a break. It's easy to get lost in the work and forget to take a break down there all alone. But, I wasn't alone. Several times, I'd caught movement on the bottom, just in my peripheral. But when I turned to look, all was still, completely motionless. There were things just outside the circle of lights, though, and I was sure of it. As the day drew to a close, I began ascending toward my tube and rest. I would soon have to begin disassembling the pipeline that John had messed up, and I didn't look forward to it. Just as I passed out from the light of the worksite, something moved just behind me. In the wake of its movement, I was pushed to the side. I shone my light around frantically, searching out the cause, but saw nothing. Shark was my first thought, and, well, my first worry, and usually we weren't bothered with them, but it wasn't unheard of in this line of work. I hurried up the line, my light swinging and arcing wildly through the water as I went. I had ascended about forty feet when the creature swam by me again. This time, it bumped me. And as I turned with my light, I saw something that looked similar to Stingray swimming into the blackness. Did that thing have arms? I mean, I seen arms, and long hair trailing out, winnowing through the water from its head. My heart thuttered and thundered in my ears and my vision swam. Concentrating on my breathing, I pulled myself along the line forcing my movements to be steady and in control. I couldn't have seen that. It was simply a weird deep sea creature that resembled a human. Besides, I had felt the scales scratching along my rubber suit. If it had scales, it wasn't human in any way. Another 20 feet and I'd convinced myself that I'd not seen anything too unusual. Ten feet later, well, I came face to face with the creature. It was blocking my ascent, right in my face. I let go of the line and kicked backwards. Dangerous, but no more dangerous than coming into contact with that thing. 
It was huge, easily twice my size, maybe larger considering that its midsection was shaped that of a ray, flat and rounded, constantly moving. It had been clutching my line with a hand that sported webbed fingers and black talons. Its eyes were enormous and shaped like almonds, taking up almost the complete top half of its face. Directly below the eyes was its round maw full of tiny yellow sharp teeth. I kicked backwards as it advanced and soon the ascension line was far out of my reach and I was struggling to get away. I bumped into something and my heart nearly exploded with fear. Tentacles wrapped around me and I fought to keep them at bay. The thing was dragging me farther down, away from the monster on my line, and farther away from safety. My radio wasn't working, so there was no help from topside either. I was completely alone. The tentacles didn't have suckers on them. The more I struggled, the more painful the thing's grip became. I didn't need my light to feel the tiny puncturing spikes on the tentacles. And the other creature swam in spirals down to us and reached out with its talons to tap the glass of my mask. I was too scared to scream. I only stared wide-eyed and with that scream stuck in my throat. I was going to die down there in the grip of sea monsters and there was not a damn thing I could do about it. And so I stopped fighting, so the spikes wouldn't puncture my suit. The thing took me to the bottom, to the work site. It wrapped one tentacle around me, pinning my arms to my sides and pushed me away from its sinewy body so that I could look at it. It was some sort of hybrid squid that had no human features at all but it did have intelligence in its eyes. Its body undulated, and I watched in disgust. God, please don't let it end like this. I thought, still paralyzed with fear and a certain amount of pain from the spikes encircling me. The other creature swam away, and I could hear its high-pitched call ringing out through the water. It hurt my eyes, and my eyes watered a little. More of the stingray things came into sight. It was a crowd of them, and the crowd parted, turned their heads in unison to the dark. Something was coming. Something big. The creatures began shaking toward whatever it was, as if they were pious worshippers beckoning their deity. The thing holding me began to relax its grip, and my brain kicked into gear. If the tentacle let loose enough, I might escape. I couldn't tear my eyes from the darkness, and I could perceive movement there behind the veil of black. The thing holding me shivered and shuddered, as if in fear, surely. I was reading human emotions into this monster's actions, but that's what it seemed like. The larger creature was emerging from the black waters. It moved slowly, confidently, even. The head emerged first, big as a Volkswagen bug and laden on each side with long, willowy, whisker-like protrusions that fluttered in the water. The mouth looked like that of a lion, but much, much larger, and minus fur. The thing's body was longer than a school bus and worm-like. It had a double set of tentacles just below its face. It moved through the water like a snake moves on land. And as it passed through the parted crowd, one of the tentacles shot out, snagged one panicked creature, and drew it close. The mouth didn't open, but the section of its belly below the set of tentacles did. From this, several long, worm-like bodies poked out, and at the end of each worm was a round maw like that of the first monster I'd met. These mouths made short work of the struggling creature. The tentacle that was holding me fell from around me, and I began floating upward, unnoticed as that horror drew ever closer to the squid hybrid. 
which seemed to shrink away from the advance. Soon, the ascent line was within reach, and I knew I would be out of the circle of light. I didn't dare kick or flail to speed my escape. They would notice the movement of the water if I did. Not nearly soon enough, I had the line in my hand and was ascending fast. The medical crew thought I'd flipped shit when I began telling them what had happened. I had moments of pure panic and terror once I was back in the tube. In those moments, I was certain those creatures, those monsters had followed me and would break through all the reinforced steel to get me, to offer me to their leader, or whatever that thing had been. I heard a couple of them joking about crazy being contagious, and that John and I had both caught it apparently. Yeah, well, big hoot for them. They hadn't seen those things. As soon as we were able to go topside, I would ask John if he'd seen them. About a month after we were put topside, John and I sat drinking in a local bar. We'd avoided talking about what had happened down there. We had avoided each other for the most part. I finally questioned him about what happened, and he said he thought he was losing his mind, that the isolation of the job was finally getting to him, and he'd wanted out. He'd seen things down there that couldn't possibly exist. Well, at least I had my answers. I wasn't crazy, neither was John. So, the company put a crew of six men down there to complete the job. Two weeks later, they all disappeared, except for one. He had ascended from the seafloor straight up to the surface and died afterward. The medical crew recorded his ramblings about the monsters and added them to their files of mine and John's ramblings. The government ordered those files destroyed, and John and I were visited by officials who told us in no uncertain terms that we were to remain silent about anything we might have seen or experienced down there. They didn't want people trying to dive down there and find what we'd seen. They would pass us off as crazy, blame it on some breach of job protocol, and stick us in a high-security mental asylum for the rest of our lives. And so, there's my story. I've taken precautions to ensure that no one discovers my identity through the story, too. I just wanted people to know what lurks out there in the deep before something happens to me. I don't really trust those government goons that keep such a close watch on us these days. And you all deserve to know the truth. <laughs>